следующем году. All right, I think it's working. Okay, folks, uh, so today we're gonna continue our discussion of spin orbit coupling. And um, we're also gonna take a deep dive into the Zeeman effect. That's the plan. <clears throat> So if you have any problems hearing me, just let me know. Um, okay, so let's uh, remind ourselves where we left off from last time. Um, we are talking about uh, spin orbit. And for spin orbit, we have the electron is circling a proton, which has an electric field sticking out and it's moving with some velocity. And so then this creates a term in the Hamiltonian, um, which um, has some radial part times L dot S. All right, because the electron has some orbital motion L and uh, it has some spin S and they couple and give us an energy term L dot S. All right, and we derived all that. Um, and so then, we want to know what then is the energy correction uh, to all the energy levels um, due to this spin orbit coupling. How does it affect the hydrogen energy levels? And so we, we, we went in to do perturbation theory and we wanted to use our favorite basis, the simplest basis, which is the one we learned last semester, the one you, you learned when you learned the hydrogen atom the famous basis, which of course is your old friend psi n l m sub l m sub s basis. Um, but this, and this, these are the quantum numbers that it's degenerate and the degeneracy, the degenerate quantum numbers, degenerate quantum numbers are uh, indexed by the eigenvalues of the operators L squared, LZ, and SZ. And so then we have to ask ourselves, um, what happens in the degenerate subspace? Are the off diagonal elements uh, in, are the off diagonal elements of H prime, um, in the degenerate subspace equal to zero? That's the question. I'll call it H prime IJ. That's the matrix element. That's representing an off diagonal matrix element. And the big question in degenerate perturbation theory is whether or not that's zero. We, we need it to be zero or else we're screwed by the divergence of our perturbation formula. So we, uh, we can, we did, I actually did the, calculation, you can do the brute force calculation of the off diagonal matrix element, uh, but I don't wanna do that. Now we're gonna use this elegant theorem that I went over last time. I'm not gonna go over the theorem again, you know, all the little mathematical nuances of the theorem. I want you guys to go over it and to think about it, but now I'm just gonna use it. I wanna show you how to use it. It's Even if the math is confusing to you, using the theorem is actually kind of easy because we just, to use the theorem to see, is it a good basis? We have to answer that question, is it a good basis? We already know it's not because we did the brute force calculation, but let's use the new theorem. The new theorem says that these, I can call these the T operators using the language of the new theorem. And so then I just have to look to see whether um, H prime is um, commutes with them. And if we look at H prime, uh, which is um, 
f of r l dot s, then we see that indeed um, um, uh, it it commutes with l squared, but it does not commute with uh, l z, and it does not commute with s z. So right away we know that this is a bad basis. This tells us that it's a bad basis using the ideas from the new theorem. And so basically we need to find a good basis where the operators that index the degenerate subspace commute with H prime, that's the, that's the idea. So then let's consider a new basis. Uh, and so we have to find a new basis that is good. And a good basis means that the off-diagonal matrix elements of the uh, perturbation in the degenerate subspace are zero. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, let's let's guess. <laughs> let's just try a new basis and let's just see what we can come up with. And so uh, the only other basis that we can think of is the basis where we uh, convert the uh, uh, M the L M L M S into um, N L J M J. Basically, we are finding a new basis by adding the angular momentum. Because remember, we talked about addition of angular momentum. And I told you that when you add angular momentum, you're really just converting to a new basis. So now we're actually using that concept and using that trick in great detail. So adding angular momentum means converting to a new basis. So now we're gonna use the new basis that we get by adding the angular momentum. And it turns out that this new basis will be a good basis. And so this old basis is indexed by L squared LZ and S Z, those are the quantum numbers that, um, those are the, that define the degenerate subspace, but now the new quantum numbers are, are indexed by L squared, J squared, and J Z. That's the new basis. And so we're doing a, we're converting a basis. We're going from this basis where the eigenstates look like Um, N, L, L, M sub L, S, M sub S, and we're converting it to a new basis that looks like this, R, N sub L. The radial part is the same, but now all of the angular momentum is in this new state, J, M, J. And um, uh, we know that the properties of this new total angular momentum state where if I say that J is equal to L plus S, then we can see that J squared acting on this new um, eigenstate J M J is equal to H bar squared J, J plus one, J M J, and Jz acting on this eigenstate is equal to h bar mj j mj. So this is the new eigenstate, the total angular momentum eigenstate, total angular momentum eigenstate. And so the question is, uh, is this a good basis? How do we check? So now to check, we're, to check if it's a good basis, we just have to take our perturbation and see if these, I'll call them the T operators equals zero, if they commute with it. The, the new third, the new operators that index the degenerate subspace. And so in this case, the, the operators are L squared, J squared, and JZ. So we have to check is uh, L squared L dot S equal to zero and it does equal to zero and does um, does uh, uh, J squared L dot S 
equal to zero. And in fact, it does. And that's a homework problem. So I'm not going to derive it now. But and then we can also ask ourselves, does um, Jz commute with the perturbation L dot S? And it does. So therefore, even without doing this fancy brute, not fancy, but without doing the brute force calculation of the off diagonal matrix element, we can just see immediately that this is a good basis. Uh, in other words, uh, psi n l j m j is a good basis because the commutators work. Because the, degen the, because the operators that index the degenerate subspace all commute with the perturbation. And that's, that's the key, that's the key trick. Um, okay, and so now let's, so now that we have a good basis, then we can, then we can find, we can, then we can use perturbation theory. And perturbation theory is, once you have a good basis, perturbation theory is really easy because perturbation theory just tells us that the change in energy for the uh, NL J M J state is just equal to the, expect the uh, expectation value of the perturbation in uh, that for that state. J M J H prime psi N L J M J. So we just have to calculate that, and it's not too hard. Uh, so we'll just, we'll just calculate it. Um, it's um, the change in energy um, is equal to, you just got to calculate that thing. So it's going to be psi N L J M J. I got F of R psi N L J M sub J. Oh, shoot. Got my little L dot S in there. Uh, okay, but the, then the question is, how do we calculate that? That's what we got to do. <clears throat> um, and so now we're going to use a trick. It's called this. Well, many people call it the spin orbit trick. Many people don't, but I like to call it the spin orbit trick. So it turns out that calculating this matrix element is really easy using the spin orbit trick. And so I want you guys all to learn the spin orbit trick and to remember it because it's a favorite of professors to stick on midterms. Um, and so the spin orbit trick is this. You, you, we wanna calculate the expectation value of L dot S. But L dot S is like a weird operator we've never seen before. We don't know really how to deal with it, you know, because it's 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 LX, SX plus LY, SY plus LZ, SZ, and there's raising and lowering operators, and it looks really complicated. So how the hell do you calculate it? It's really complicated. But it turns out there's a really beautiful trick. Once you add the angle momentum, there's a very simple trick. You just say that J is equal to L plus S. And then you just can see immediately that J squared is equal to L squared plus S squared plus two L dot S. I just squared this thing, okay? I just dotted it into itself and that's what you get. But then you notice that you got that L dot S there. And so then you right here. And so then we can just solve for L dot S. L dot S is equal to one half times j squared minus l squared minus s squared. It's a very cute trick. And then we can very easily calculate the change in energy now using this trick, because now what we do is we just say delta E is equal to that function of R. I can pull that out. Oh, actually, no, I can't. I'm sorry. Let's, let's do it correctly. It's going to be um, R and L. J M J, that's the state. Psi N L J M J. Um, and then I have F of R uh, times one half um, J squared minus L squared minus S squared R N L J M J. And then the radial part, 
can just slide right through because this is all or this is all angular stuff and spin stuff this guy so he can skip over that and he but he hits this dude f of r and so then what we can do is we can calculate um then we can separate out the um r and l f of r the radial part r and l um and then um we can have now just the the angular momentum part i can uh, pull out the the one half and what i have is this j squared minus l squared minus s squared acting on j and j okay so this is what we get and now it turns out we can calculate this pretty easy because this this part is just an integral, right? A simple integral, so we won't worry about that right now. But then we have to calculate this weird thing. But now notice what happens when this thing hits this guy. Somebody tell me, what does that j squared turn into? Say it. Uh, j times j plus one. Exactly. Because it's an because this this is a this is an eigenstate of j squared, so j squared just turns right into h bar squared j times j plus one. It's easy, and then how about uh, l squared? Now maybe this is a little bit more subtle, but um, is j m j an eigenstate of l squared? Yes or no. No. Well, you have to remember that we're in the degenerate subspace. And so <clears throat> you have to remember that we're in, we're in the degenerate subspace of L. You know, when we when we we calculated this actually earlier and remember that um, J M J is equal to this Klebs Gordon coefficient, m sub l plus m sub s equals m sub j. And it's a Klebs Gordon coefficient of, um, we have, we're, it's, we're, we're adding up all the superpositions of product states. That's what, and that's what this total angular momentum state is. But notice that, that the thing that we're summing over is the m sub l's. Uh, but we're always within one particular L. We're always within one degenerate L manifold when we do this. And so this is Lj, M sub L, M sub S, all these Klebs Gordon coefficients. But the but the L is constant. It's always the same L. So uh, so actually these states. So actually these states always do have a well-defined L. So now I will ask you again, what happens when L squared hits that state? It's the same as hitting this state here, you see, they're equal. And so what happens when L squared hits that state? What do I get? H bar J, uh, L times L plus one. Exactly h bar squared, but yeah, that's what you meant. So exactly. Now, what happens when s squared hits that guy? <clears throat> Is j, m, j an, uh, an eigenstate of s squared? And yes. Question, what? Yes. Yeah, good. And that's actually an easier question to answer because we know that the electron always is an eigenstate of s squared because the electron always has to spin one half. So that one actually is easy. That one we, we kind of get for free. So that's going to be h squared s times s plus one. <clears throat> and what is s equal? What is s equal for the electron? One half. Yeah, it's always one half. So that's actually the easiest one. <clears throat> so we got it. So that's, e so that's easy. So we did it. Um, and so we see then that the energy of the spin orbit term is equal to, um, let's see, so 
that's going to be R and L, um, F of R, this integral that we have to solve, and L, um, and then times this uh, one half times um, what we just calculated, which is going to be h bar squared j times j plus one minus h bar squared l times l plus one minus, um, and I'll just say three quarters h bar squared because s is always one half. So this one is is, is simple and well defined. Uh, and then to then we have to calculate this integral, and there's a way to do it, which is um, it's in Griffith's problem number 7.44. He talks about it. And then what you get when you do all the math, and I'm not going to do it all, but when suppose you do all the math and, and do all the algebra, then you get an answer. And this is the answer e squared over um, 8 pi epsilon naught, uh, 1 over m squared c squared uh, times 1 over l times l plus 1 half times l plus 1 uh, times n cubed times a naught cubed, where a naught is the uh, Bohr radius. And the Bohr radius is a number which is uh, the radius of, of a hydrogen atom, one half angstrom. Um, uh, okay, so um, that's 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 the uh, that's the value. Um, let's see if I get that right. Uh, shit. Okay, actually, that's not right. Damn it! I copied the wrong formula. Uh, so. Actually, what I just copied was the formula for um, this term. If you if you calculate that radial term, then this then you get this formula. Sorry, there's not so many big formulas, and so then when you plug that in, when you plug that in and, and add up all the terms, then you get the final formula. For the spin orbit coupling, which is equal to, um, oh, I wish I had not done that. I have more writing to do. Uh, one over m squared c squared, and then you get this kind of complicated expression. But now you understand where it comes from, so it's not so complicated. Uh, minus l times l plus one minus three quarters. Then you have to divide by uh, that other part, L times L plus one half, L plus one, N cubed, A naught cubed. Okay, so this is the final answer for the spin orbit coupling. And now there's a trick that we can do. So that's it. So we, we calculated the current, the that's what we get from first order perturbation theory when we use the good basis, when you kind of go through all the details, that's the, that's the term. But now there's a trick, uh, there's an additional trick that we can do. And the trick that we can do, the new trick is to add, uh, we're gonna add the spin orbit term plus uh, the relativistic correction that we derived before relativistic term, the one that we calculated previously, we're going to add those. And when we add them, we're going to call that the fine structure. So that, so that, that, that is, that is the, so the fine structure correction to the hydrogen atom is really the addition of the spin orbit term plus the relativistic term. And when you take those two terms, now we've derived from both, and they both have these complicated formulas that we wrote down. This is one of them right above here. And then there was also a complicated formula for the relativistic term. Now there's something really cute, which is not completely obvious, but you could figure it out if you go do a bunch of algebra. If you add these two terms, then you get some cancellation of the terms. It's a really cute little thing to notice. 
<clears throat> and um, I'm not going to derive it, but if you if you look at um, and I think it's in your I, I asked you to do it in your homework, but if you look at Griffith's problem 7.20, then he describes the trick. And when you and you add those two terms, then this is what you get. You find that now you're in the new basis. Remember, we're in the basis. We're in a new basis. This is our basis, psi n, l, j, m, j. And for this basis, then what we have is that the energy of the nth state now depends on j. And so the energy for this basis, it depends not just on n, but on j also. And the energy is this negative 13.6 EV over n squared times one, and this is just our old friend E naught N, uh, plus alpha squared over N squared times N over J plus one half minus three quarters. And it's a really cute formula that everybody likes. It's so simple. Um, and alpha, is equal to the fine structure constant. Another number that everybody likes, fine structure constant. And it's equal to, does anybody know what it's equal to? It's a famous number. One over 137. That's right. I have a funny story. I, 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 I was, before I came to Berkeley, I was working at Boston University and, and I decided to leave and go to Berkeley and they got all mad at me at Boston University and they were gonna not give me my equipment. And so I negotiated and negotiated and finally they said, I negotiated with the Dean and I said, come on, man, you gotta give me my equipment. And, and, he, he, and he said, well, I need, look, we were trying to figure out how much money it was worth, how much money I should have Berkeley pay Boston University so I could have my equipment and he said, and we were arguing and arguing for months. And he said, all right, well, look, why don't you just give us $137,000 since that's the inverse of the fine structure constant. So I always remember that number. So I gave them $137,000 and got all my shit. So it was cool. Uh, okay, so fine structure constant is one over 137. Um, and there's also a formula for it, which is E squared over four pi epsilon naught H bar C. Um, and it's a very famous number, and it's important. Uh, okay, and so now what we see then is that the fine structure perturbation. Um, so, so we see that the uh, we see that the energy levels of hydrogen are split by uh, J. Because when you look at this formula, you see that it depends really only on J and of course on N. So you already knew that the energy levels are split by N. That's what you knew previously, but now we have a new splitting, which is J. And so here's an example. Let's consider, for example, the N equals three level of hydrogen. And so you know that the N equals three level of hydrogen, you know that you get a bunch of degeneracy because I have L equals zero. Well, what are the allowed Ls in the N equals three level? Tell me. <clears throat> what are the allowed Ls in N equals three? Tell me. Zero, one, two. Exactly. Zero, one, and two. Um, and then we know then that J, remember that J is equal to L plus S and S for the electron is always one half. So that means then that J is always gonna go from um, L plus 
one half all the way down to what? Can you tell me? The absolute value of L minus one half. Exactly. That's right. It goes from L plus one half to L minus one half. So if I have um, if I have L equals zero, then what is J equal to? Tell me. <clears throat> one half. Um, yes. Perfect. Just one half. Now, if L equals one, then what is J equal to? Tell me. Um, three halves and one half. That's exactly right. You're just plugging into this formula. Perfect. Um, one half comma three halves. Now, if L equals two, what is J equal to? Tell me. Five halves, three halves, and one half. Well, <laughs> this is tricky. What's L plus one half? What's L plus one half? One half. Five halves? Yes, what's L minus one half? Three halves. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so what is, so tell me, what is J equal to again? Tell me again. Five halves and three halves. Yes, exactly. Five halves and three halves. That's right. Or maybe I should write it in the other order because I'm going from small to big. Um, three halves, five halves. Exactly. So those are all the allowed J's from those L's. So that means these L equals zero, one, and two levels are going to turn into now these new levels. J equals one half, three halves, and five halves. Now we see that there's a lot of degeneracy within the J's because for that, for example, for the J equals one half, we see that the L can be zero or one. And we see that for J equals three halves, the L can be um, one or two. So there's a lot of degeneracy in here, like, you know, L equals um, zero one for this guy. And here I can have L equals uh, one and two for this guy. So there's degeneracy living inside, but there's only three J's. And so that means that this level is gonna split. Now th this level, before we turn on the fine structure, this level for N equals three was completely degenerate. All the states had the same energy, but now we've turned on the fine structure, spin over plus relativistic correction. And so now how many, how many levels do we have now? That's the question I'm asking you, how many? Three levels. Yes, that's exactly right. Very good. Because of this formula, we're just, so it's, it's this formula. So we just wanna plot that formula. And if we calculate that formula, then what you'll see is that notice that the energy correction is negative because of the negative sign. If you just look at the formula and the results of the algebra. And so now when we plot that formula, we see that's the starting point. And we see that we get splitting we get the first level and we get the second level and then we get the third level. And if you look at the formula, you see that the lowest energy is um, J equals one half. <clears throat> and then I have J equals three halves and then I get J equals five halves and then you can calculate these energy level splits from that formula that I had above. And there's a notation that people use. You can call this delta E three comma um, five halves, where that number denotes N and that number denotes J. And so then this one could be a delta E three comma three halves, and this one is gonna be delta E three comma one half. 
All right, so there's lots of notation and this is atomic physics, you know, we're doing, now we're doing atomic physics. This is hardcore atomic physics. So if you're an atomic physicist then you know this stuff really well, but the rest of us sort of <laughs> barely remember it because it's like so many indices, your mind starts swimming with N's and J's and L's and M's. And, but still, you, you know, you got to learn it, you know, you got to, you got to go through it because this is basically how atoms work, you know, this is how the energy level structure of atoms uh is defined you know and and so these little splittings tell us why you know the leaves on your tree are green and the glass in your window is transparent it all comes from this okay so you know even though there's some little nuances and complications it's very important it determines the way the world works so that's it's worth learning um okay <clears throat> and so now um so okay so that's that's that uh, yeah. I have a question. Okay. So is this saying that I, I might be just confused, but is this saying that there's nothing, no such thing as same energy state? Because it seems like we we thought it was degenerate when we were just looking at n values, but if we consider the small corrections, then the um, energy state split. So is it saying that if we add those little corrections, then actually there's no states that are in the same energies? I uh, know the, 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 the degeneracy is partially split because look, there's huge degeneracy within these levels. That level is degenerate. And remember, you see, it has, it has, uh, L equals um, one and two, and it also has um, M sub J is between uh, negative three halves and positive three halves. You see what I'm saying? So take a look at this J equals three half state. It's hugely degenerate. So each of these states are, are degenerate. This guy here, is uh, degenerate in, uh, uh, what is this guy? L equals one half is degenerate in, I mean, J equals one half is degenerate in L equals zero and one and negative one half M sub J positive one half. You see what I'm saying? And this guy is degenerate in uh, minus five halves, M sub J, and positive five halves. So these energy levels are still very degenerate, but they're not as degenerate as before. So it's sort of like, the way to think about it is that the, the, each atomic energy level is hugely degenerate when you start. You know, it has two N squared degeneracy, but then when I turn on the fine structure, some of the degeneracy is lifted, but not all. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if we turn on the fine structure or if we calculate more, the smaller corrections, then can we in principle find non-degeneracy? Yes, we're, I'm, actually, I'm about to talk about that. The, the way to find non-degeneracy, because right now, if we only include the fine structure, as you can see from what I just wrote down, the energy levels continue to be hugely degenerate. They are less degenerate than before, but they're still hugely degenerate. But in order to lift the degeneracy completely, there's something we need to do in the laboratory. Can somebody tell me what that is? Extra ERB field. Say it one more time, please. I didn't quite hear you. Uh, like extra E or B field? Yes. Which one? We only need one. Uh, B field? Yes. Crank up a B field and the degeneracy goes away. Poof. Let's talk about that right now. The loss of degeneracy comes from uh, when we turn on an external B field. And this is called the what effect. Can somebody tell me? Zeeman effect. Exactly. So that's what we're about to discuss right now. The Zeeman effect. And so let's discuss it. So the Zeeman effect is what happens when we turn on a B field. And so <clears throat> the way to think about it <clears throat> is um, 
um, I mean, the way to think about it is, you know, I have this. I mean, this is what you should picture in your mind. I have a battery, and I got some, and I got a um, solenoid, and this causes current to flow in the in the solenoid. And I have a, then a, a vial, let's say a glass tube, which is filled with hydrogen. And this is what the old guys did a hundred years ago. They actually did this experiment. And then what you can do is you can take your laser. Well, they didn't have lasers back then, but they had light bulbs. So let's, let's not do laser, let's do a light bulb. You can take a light bulb, which is shining light into your hydrogen. And then you can see what comes out. You have a detector, which is really a, I should say a spectrometer. It's just a diffraction grid spectrometer. And then you can sort of see what light comes out into their different wavelengths. Uh, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. So this is what people did, you know, a hundred years ago. And they saw that when they cranked up, and this is a, a knob. And so they turned the knob and they saw that they got crazy energy level splitting. They could see that it went, you know, like this. And then they got all this crazy energy splitting where this is energy. These are the energy levels of hydrogen. So this was done experimentally and those guys had no idea what was going on because they did not have quantum mechanics. <laughs> so uh, they did that experiment and they were wondering what the hell is going on, but now we know what's going on. And so now we will derive it. Uh, and so the way to understand what is going on when you crank up the B field is to, um, calc is to realize that it gives you a new term in the Hamiltonian. So here's the Hamiltonian, our old friend, you know, the hydrogen Hamiltonian, <clears throat> but then we turn on the B field and it gives us a new perturbation and we'll call that the Zeeman term. And so let's calculate what that term is in the Hamiltonian. And so to calculate H prime, we got to use classical physics, right? Because remember, this in, you know, it's, I've said it before, but the Hamiltonian always comes from classical physics. So let's let's put the magnet, let's put the electron in the magnetic field. So here's here's the electron, and now let's turn on the magnetic field B. And then um, I ask you, uh, what is the energy, H prime equals what? What is the energy? What is the classical energy of, of that spin in a B field? Can somebody tell me? I'll give you a hint. It's the dipole. It is mu dot B. Exactly. It's the dipole energy, negative mu dot B. That's exactly right where that's the dipole, that's the magnetic dipole of uh, electron with spin. <clears throat> and let's remember what a magnetic dipole is. The magnetic dipole of electron with spin. So let's try, let's remind ourselves what that magnetic dipole is. Um, because it turns out that there's two components to it. There's an orbital component plus the spin component. And I will remind you, um, this is the way to look at it. It's like, here's an electron orbiting. It's like, you know, the earth going around the sun. There's the electron, E minus, it has some spin, S, but going around, it has some orbital angular momentum, L, and it has, um, actually, let's just do it for a, an arbitrarily charged particle. Let's just call it Q. So I have a particle with charge Q, spin S, and orbital, orbital uh, angular momentum, L. So now I'm asking you, what is the mu? The mu is equal to an orbital part plus a spin part. So I now I need someone to tell me what is the orbital part. Does anybody, it's a formula. It's really easy to derive. I'm not sure that I derived it in this class. It's, you have seen it derived in like physics 7a or 7b. Does anybody remember it? Okay, well, I, maybe it's, you know, I, I don't expect you to remember it. I mean, you know, who, who, who remembers all these formulas? Nobody can remember them all, but you've derived it. And because it comes from 
current times area. Remember, this you should remember, current times area is the dipole moment where this is the area of the orbit swept out by the current. So remember, if you have a current loop with an area, then the magnetic dipole is the current times area. That should sound vaguely familiar to you. And if you then calculate it for this situation, then you see that the orbital angular momentum, the orbital magnetic dipole of that situation I've just drawn is um, Q over 2M times L. Does that look vaguely familiar? That's the magnetic moment of a current loop if I convert the current into angular momentum. So I'm thinking of the charge going around in a loop is equal to current. And if I calculate it, you get that formula. And it's a very trivial calculation, but I just don't feel like doing it right now. You, and you've all seen it, but you might not remember. Um, so that's the formula. But then what we do is for spin, for the spin, you can think of the particle as sort of like a sphere of charge, Q, that's spinning, where the angular momentum of the spin is S. So if you think of the electron as a sphere of charge that's spinning on its orbit, then you can see that the spin magnetic moment, I can use that same formula, Q over 2M times S. But because it's actually not spinning, because that's a, a false picture, we need a fudge factor. What is the fudge factor? Somebody tell me. And we, we actually mentioned this last lecture, I think. Tell me, what is the fudge factor to get the magnetic dipole of a, char of a charged particle with spin? Gyromagnetic ratio. That's exactly right. And what is G for the electron? What is G for the electron? Somebody tell me. Two. Exactly, it's two. <laughs> we can derive that. I will derive that at the, the last day of class, if there's time, because it, it comes out of the Dirac equation. Um, okay, so let's plug these numbers in, and we, and we see that the, uh, orbital ang uh, uh, the orbital magnetic dipole is minus E over 2M. L of the electron and the spin uh, is uh, the spin magnetic dipole is uh, I have minus 2e over 2ms is equal to minus e over ms. And so we then see then that the classical energy is equal to, um, let's write it it's going to be um, negative B dot, um, uh, let's get all these numbers correct, uh, negative E over 2M L plus negative E over M S. Okay, because, the, because what I've said is that the, uh, the total magnetic moment of the electron is equal to, um, Let's get these numbers all correct. Um, is equal to uh, minus E uh, over 2M times L plus 2S. Okay, there's because there's a factor of two for S, which comes from the G. That's the magnetic moment of the electron. And so we've plugged it into this formula. And so we can see then that the classical energy is equal to, um, let's get the formula for it. It's gonna be equal to E over 2M times L plus 2S dot B. Okay, so that's the classical energy of the electron in a magnetic field. We just derived it. it, has an orbital part and a spin part. Now let's turn it into a Hamiltonian. And that's easy because now we can see that the Zeeman Hamiltonian is just gonna be uh, <laughs> that formula. But let's do something. Let's, let's assume we can always pick a Z direction 
So let's assume, because if I just turn on a magnetic field and that defines the Z direction. So let's assume that B is equal to B times Z hat. Let's assume that it's pointing in the Z direction. So now let's do that dot product. All right, do the dot product. And then you can see that the Zeeman Hamiltonian is E over 2M times uh, B times LZ plus two SZ, where now these are operators because I took the classical terms, I turned them into operators. That's how you get a Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's the Zeeman Hamiltonian. We just derived it. Okay, so now what we have to do. Uh, do yeah. I have a question. Does that a Hamiltonian include the spin coupling effect too? No. Does that make sense? No, no, because. It does not. You mean the spin orbit coupling? Is that what you meant? Meant? Yeah. 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 Okay. Because what we're doing is the philosophy of what we're doing in class right now is we're looking at each perturbation separately. So we first looked at the relativistic correction, then we looked at the spin orbit correction, and now we're looking at the Zeeman correction. So we're looking at them all separately. Now, in order to solve the whole problem, we have to start looking to see how they behave relative to each other. But right now, I, I was, I'm just treating the Zeeman term completely separately. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. All right. Okay. So, so this is the Zeeman perturbation. The, we'll call it the the Zeeman term. And then what we have to ask is, of course, how does this affect the energy levels of hydrogen? As I crank up a magnetic field, and this is what the old guys did in the laboratory. As I turn that power supply on, you know, and, and, and pass more current through my uh, inductor, you can see it in the picture, the, the solenoid, I get a stronger and stronger magnetic field, right? There's the magnetic field. And so then how does it, what happens to the energy levels? As, how do they split? So the, basically the question is, what is the change in the energy levels of the, uh, hydrogen atom uh, as B is turned on. Okay, so how do those energy levels split? Um, and so um, it turns out that this is not a completely trivial question to answer. This is actually a hard question to answer. And the reason it's hard to answer is because there's three regimes three different regimes. And it really depends on how strong the magnetic field is. And the, the, it, and the, there's the three regimes, it's sort of like the three bears, you know, the, the three little bears go into the cabin and they say, this porridge is too hot, this porridge is too cold, and this porridge is just right. And so there's always three different regimes for everything, basically. And the three different regimes are always kind of the same. There's always going to be a weak field regime, right? A strong field regime. And then between the two, uh, there's always going to be an intermediate regime. So really, this is true for any phenomenon. There's always going to be a, you know, the weak regime, the strong regime, and then the middle regime. And, you know, in physics, um, in physics, it, it's sort of like a recurring pattern. One of these regimes is always the hardest one. Which one can you guess? Which one is always the hardest? Strong or intermediate? Exactly. The middle one is always hardest. That's almost always the case in physics because if it's really weak, you can make approximations. You can say, oh, it's teeny tiny. I can approximate it away. Or if it's really strong, you can make approximations. But when it's in the middle, your approximations all go to hell. And that's a really a general concept in physics, but let's look at the specifics now. So the, it turns out that, so let's, let's solve these three regimes. We're gonna solve them one by one. So let's solve the first one. The first one is uh, the easiest. So the easiest, it turns out, is the strong field. And the strong field means so strong, what does strong even mean? How do I define strong? Uh, well, I'm gonna ask you that. I, I have my Zeeman term 
And the strong field regime is defined that the Zeeman term is much bigger than what? Can you guess? The magnetic moment of the electron. Or the well, field the produced by moment, the electron. The magnetic moment of the electron is built into the Zeeman term already. So that's like a sort of a fixed quantity. But the strong field regime is when the energy of the Zeeman term, which depends on the magnetic moment of the electron, when that Zeeman energy is bigger than some other energy. What is that other energy that I have to compare it to? Well, what are the energies we've been talking about up to now? There's the, the I'll, I'll give you a hint. There's one energy, which is E naught, the unperturbed energy, which is negative 13.6 EV. Hydrogen fine structure, hydrogen fine structure term. Exactly, because that's the only other energy there is. There's the E naught, and then there's the delta E of the, the fine structure energy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So. It's when the Zeeman Hamiltonian is way bigger than the fine structure Hamiltonian. And the fine structure is defined as the relativistic correction plus the spin orbit correction. All right, that's what the fine structure is. So this is the regime where I crank up the Zeeman effect so big that it dominates over the fine structure Hamiltonian. And so what does that mean? So, 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 so for this case, that means I can ignore the fine structure Hamiltonian. That's what makes it easy. I can just, I can just forget about all that fine structure, that relativistic and spin orbit. I can just go, ah, who cares, and dump it. So that's why it's so easy. But then the next easy one, which is a little harder, but still re re reasonably easy, is called the weak field regime. And that is when the Zeeman term is much smaller than what? Tell me. Weak field. The Zeeman energy is much smaller than what energy? Fine structure. Exactly. And that one is also reasonably easy, and we'll we'll do it. We'll do it. And then there's a third regime, <laughs> which is the intermediate, which is the hard one the intermediate, and this one, of course, is when the Zeeman energy term is on the same order as the fine structure. And then you're basically screwed because there's no approximations that you can make anymore. Um, okay, so let's do that one by one. I don't know that we'll have time to do them all, but let's try. Let's see how far we go. Uh, let's start with the strong field, which is the easiest. It's always nice to do the easiest first. Easiest first is the strong field. And so then what we want to know is what is the change in energy of a hydrogen atom due to the Zeeman term? And so we use perturbation theory, of course. And so we say that uh, H equals H naught plus H prime. And so now I'm going to ask you, what is H naught? Tell me. <clears throat> Line structure. Well, uh, strong field regime, the Zeeman term is way bigger than the fine structure. So we're going to make the approximation that the fine structure Hamiltonian is equal to what? Tell me. Zero? Yes. That's right. Perfect. So what is, so now I go back to my question, what is H naught? Is that the Coulomb term? Yeah, it's just the normal hydrogen atom, right? Which is just, you know, the normal kinetic energy, you know, plus potential energy of the hydrogen atom. You know, what you did last semester, I'm not even gonna write it up. And what's the H prime? What's the perturbation in this case? The Zeeman. Yes, exactly, the Zeeman term. That's exactly right. And so H prime is equal to uh, let's write out the little formula, little Zeeman formula. It's uh, 
E B over two M L plus not L, it's L Z. L Z plus two S Z, which we derived. Okay, that's the H prime, it's the Zeeman term. Um, and so now I want to use perturbation theory. And so the first, so we have to, so to, to do perturbation theory, the first thing we do is we pick a basis. And for the basis, let's use our easiest basis. The simplest basis is the old one that you learned last semester, which is psi n l m sub l m sub s. And we ask ourselves, is this degenerate? Yes or no? Is it degenerate? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, massively degenerate. So now using this new newfangled reasoning, using this fancy new theorem that we derived, what we ask ourselves, instead of like calculating, instead of directly calculating the off-diagonal matrix elements in the degenerate subspace, which is quite tedious, what we do is we say, well, what are the operators that index the degenerate subspace? That's sort of how we think about it now. And when we look at this, we notice that, okay, the degenerate subspace is indexed by the, the uh, eigenvalues of L squared, the eigenvalues of the operator LZ, and the eigenvalues of the operator uh, S sub Z. And so now to see if this is a good basis, we have to take these three operators, which I'll call just the T operators, using the notation of this new theorem, and I have to see if T commutes with what? Tell me. With what? H prime. I couldn't hear you. What? That's Zeman Hamilton 20. Perfect. Exactly. That's what we have to do. We're now at H prime is the Zeman. That's exactly right. So, so if it commutes, if those operators commute with H prime, then is it a good basis or a bad basis? Can you just say it? If those operators commute with H prime, is it good or bad? It's good. Yes, exactly. We want that. So let's see if it's true. So what we got to do then is uh, I got um, L squared. And for the Zeeman term, I have LZ plus 2SZ. And if you do that commutator, you'll see that it's zero. And then, I, and, and these are home, this is homework problem. So I'm not gonna work this out, but you know, you have LZ commuting with LZ and 2SZ. And I think you can see that that one pretty easily is zero. And then you also have to do um, SZ with uh, LZ and 2SZ. And that one also, it's pretty easy to see that that one's zero too. So that's great. All three of these operators that index the degenerate subspace commute with the perturbation. And so that means that we have a good basis. So that means that without doing anything else, we can just calculate, we can use perturbation theory. So now we can use the formula with this basis, our old basis, the easiest one. So let's do that. So that just means then that delta E uh, is equal to, I just calculate the expectation value of N L M sub L M sub S. <clears throat> and I plug in my perturbation, which is E B over two M L Z plus two S Z. And I just sandwich it N L M sub L M sub S. And this is really great because this is this is like totally easy to calculate because is this so so look is this thing an eigenstate of SZ? What happens when SZ hits that state? What do I get? Tell me. Tell me. What happens when SZ hits that state? <clears throat> In your mind, you should be asking yourself, is it an eigenstate? And if it is an eigenstate, then what is the eigenvalue? 
Somebody tell me. Isn't it H M sub S? Exactly. H bar M sub S. And there's a little factor of two from there. Good. Now, is this state an eigenstate of L sub Z? Yes or no? Is it? Answer me. Is it? Somebody answer me. Yes. Good. What is the eigenvalue? H bar ML. Perfect. Yeah. And so that means that this is, that we're, we're basically done. We see that the delta E is equal to E B over 2M times, I'll pull the H bar out. H bar comes out and I have ML plus 2M sub S. That's it. We're done. We got it. And that's really nice because that means that this tells us that there's lots of splitting. That means that if I crank up the magnetic field really high, I get lots of splitting because let's, because I used to have, for example, the nth energy level, which is degenerate in, I got my L's, I got my M sub L's, and I got my M sub S's, right? It's very degenerate. 2N squared degeneracy. But then all these energy levels split. I get, I get lots of splitting because all the different M sub L's and the M sub S's split according to this formula, because of this formula. Okay. So that's the splitting. I'm not gonna, you know, draw it. It's, it's a homework problem. So you guys will do it more in your homework. Okay, so that's that's the uh, the strong field. So that's the easy one. Now let's do uh, a harder one. The, the weak field is harder, but still doable. Let's do the weak field now. And in this case, I have the Zeeman term is way smaller than the fine structure. And so now I want to do use perturbation theory. Uh, let's use perturbation theory. But to use perturbation theory, we always have to divide our Hamiltonian into the unperturbed case plus the perturbation. Now I will ask you, what is the unperturbed Hamiltonian? Somebody tell me. And, and the quest, yes. Coulomb. Okay, that's the old one. Kinetic energy plus potential energy, where the potential energy is the Coulomb. So that, that's, I know that's what you meant when you said that. So, okay, is that enough? Yes or no? I guess we should add fine structure because it's much bigger than Zeeman. Yes, exactly. That's the trick. The trick is that now we cannot ignore the fine structure because the fine structure is way bigger than the Zeeman. Exactly. So now we will say the kinetic energy plus potential energy plus the fine structure. But we're still going to use perturbation theory because the fine structure, so, so even though I can't ignore the fine structure, it's still easy because I'm going to still use perturbation there. I'm just going to put the fine structure as, as part of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So I'm still using the whole perturbation framework. The reason why I mention that is because when we do the intermediate case, the whole perturbation framework <laughs> falls apart. But uh, let's not worry about that. Uh, let's just look at, uh, um, let's, let's, so let's do this. So that's my H naught. And then my H prime is what? What's H prime? Zeeman. Exactly. That's right. So, so that means that if H, if this is my H naught unperturbed Hamiltonian, then what is my basis? My basis H is the psi, and I'll give you, I'll say, I'll do the first one. The first quantum number is N. What's the second quantum number? And then the third, and then the fourth. What are the quantum numbers? What's the second quantum number? Tell me. 
L? Yes. What's the third quantum number? J. Perfect. And what's the fourth? MJ. That's exactly right. And so um, I have my, um, so I can see that. So then that's exactly right. And so these are, and so I can see that the quantum numbers are indexed by L squared, J squared, and, uh, and JZ. Um, and so then the question is, is this, to, I want to use perturbation theory, but the question in my mind is, is this a good basis? So is it a good basis? Yes or no? And so we have to then, we have to look at the degenerate subspace. In the degenerate subspace, then what are the operators that index the degenerate subspace? This is a slightly subtle question. First, what is the, what defines the degenerate subspace? All the blank states are degenerate. Tell me what defines a degenerate subspace? I'll draw a little picture while you're thinking. Uh, is it all the states for a certain energy level? Yeah, but which energy level? I'm asking, so these are the degenerate subspaces. Uh, the J values? Yes. That's the first degenerate subspace. This is the second degenerate subspace. And this is the third, et cetera. That's exactly right. And so now I'm asking you, remember what we want to do is we want to see, we want to do this trick. We want to do H prime comma T. And we want to see if my perturbation commutes with my T operator. But, the, but what is the T operator? All right, the T operator are the, uh, is the operators that index the degenerate subspace. So, so if I take a particular degenerate subspace, I'm asking you, what is the degeneracy in that subspace? What, that subspace is degenerate in which quantum numbers? That's the question, which, and the quantum numbers are these ones, you know, that it's, I have psi n, L, J, M, J. Which are the quantum numbers that are degenerate in the subspace? Tell me. M, J. Very good. But is that all? Is that all? What? Isn't it J and M sub J? No, no. J is the same. So all the, all the states in a degenerate subspace have the same J. So J doesn't give you any more information in the degenerate subspace. They all have the same J. So that's not like the index. I'm asking like for all the different states in the degenerate subspace, what are they indexed by? And she said MJ and she was right, but that's not the whole answer. The L? Yes, because some of those states have different L. Remember for the uh, N equals three, you know, some had L equals zero plus one half, the others had, you know, it could be others had L equals one or two, you know, there's all these different um, L's. Okay. And so that means that the important operators are L squared and JZ. These are my T operators. And so now I have to see if H prime commutes with L squared and if H prime commutes with JZ. All right, we're, and where H prime, of course, is my Zeeman term. So these are the commutators you have to calculate. And, um, and remember that H prime is equal to, uh, what is it, EB over 2M, uh, LZ plus 2SZ. So when we plug H prime into here, then we see that uh, it does indeed commute, okay? So I'm not gonna work out the details, but it's not so hard. That's like homework problems for you guys. 
And so it does commute. Yes, it commutes. Yay, it commutes. So, so I will ask you the question, is this a good basis? Is this a good basis, yes or no? Yes. Good, that's right. It is a good basis. Because Really quickly, uh, why did you choose, why did you go straight to the J instead of also trying to, going the other route beforehand? Uh, like, is there a motivation for taking the, the summation of the, the, the um, like the J, as opposed to doing uh, L, M, and uh, sorry, S, well, the other one, basically. The other yeah, 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 yeah. The motivation was here at the very beginning, because it was here when we picked H naught, see? What I just circled? H naught includes the fine structure. And so that means that if I include the fine structure, then we, we know that the N L M sub L M sub S is a bad basis for fine structure because of the L dot S term does not commute. Okay. Right? Okay, so that's the answer. To, so that's the answer to your yeah, question, yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. And so now we have this as our good basis. And so now we can plug into the formula, the, the perturbation formula. So then we see that now we have the, the energy splitting is just going to be, I just take the good basis states and I just calculate the expectation value of the perturbation in that basis. So let's do it. And so now we, we do it <clears throat> and then, um, we uh, let's just calculate it. And so we, we have this, we have the R and L, we have the J M, um, and now we have the, uh, the E B over two M L plus L Z plus two S Z uh, R and L uh, J M. Now I'll use a little trick, which I'll notice that we know that um, LZ plus SZ is equal to JZ. And so LZ plus two SZ is equal to JZ plus SZ. Okay, just a little trick. And so I'm going to, um, so you can see that, that this thing, is this thing, okay? So, so now what's gonna happen is uh, this guy is gonna hit this guy. And is this state an eigenstate of Jz? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. What? No. Well, I have Jm. Is that an eigenstate of JZ, yes or no? Oh, I thought you were talking about the R and L. If it's JM, then yes. Yeah, but of the R and L, you can almost say it's like, it's trivial because the R and L is just a constant to JZ. Because, you know, R and L is radial, whereas JZ is angular plus spin. So, you know, R and L is just like a constant to it. So, uh, okay, so what does JZ turn into? What does Jz turn into? What does Jz turn into? Somebody tell me. H bar mj. That's exactly right. Well, that's mj. And so now we see that the that the energy splitting is equal to. Um, let me see the right way to write this out. I don't want to screw this up. Um, so the R and L is going to just go through everything and it's going to hit that guy and it's just going to turn into one, just slides over. And so I can ignore the R and L. And so it's going to be this, I'm going to end up with, um, E, E, B over two M times, um, uh, the first term, which was easy, we just did it, h bar mj, 
But now I have plus this other term, which is not so easy, which is going to be J M S Z J M. Okay, so that's what I have to calculate. Now this term is not so simple to calculate because the J M uh, it's not so obvious like what is the eigenvalue of S sub Z for J M. But what we can do is you can just use, for example, you can just use the the, the Klebsch Gordon coefficients because you know that you can calculate it, you can figure it out. J M is equal to a sum over M L plus M S equals M J. And that's going to be C, the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, uh, times uh, L M sub L S M sub S. So, you know, you can sort of see that you have all your, uh, you can see that you have the, the eigenstates of, of, these are the eigenstates of S sub Z. Uh, and so you can see that, so you can imagine that if I, if I calculate, if I hit this state with S sub Z, then it's the same as hitting this state with S sub Z. And if you knew all those Klebsch Gordon coefficients, you could calculate it. Uh, and so you can do it and it's done. So to see it done, uh, it's done in the book by Gazi Orowitz. I think it's, it's also done by Griffiths. So you can sort of see the clever way to do this calculation. I'm not gonna go through the details, but when you, when you do go through the details, you will find, you'll get this answer. You can get an answer and you can see that the Zeeman energy level splitting is E B H bar over two M times mj times one plus or minus one over two l plus one where it depends which j we're talking about j is equal to l plus or minus one half so it depends which j and so you can see that it that it splits it splits the date the j it splits the JZ degeneracy and it also splits um, the, uh, the L squared degeneracy. And so the bottom line is that you get this, if you have the nth level that has huge degeneracy of L, um, uh, M sub L, M sub S, that's the original state and then the fine structure gives us the, uh, shows us that we get splitting of the uh, L, we go to the, the new basis for fine structure. And the new fine structure basis is this, where we have J1, J2, J3. That's the fine structure. But now uh, this is the, the fine structure splitting but now we get additional splitting. These guys split even more. This is the way you should picture it. And this is the, this is the, uh, we're getting splitting of the um, M sub J's and the uh, L's split by this formula, see? And so that's the way you should picture it is that all those, all those J states split. They, the J states used to be degenerate due to the fine structure, but now the different J's split according to this formula. And that is uh, the end of today's lecture. I'm sorry for going over. Okay, bye-bye, bye-bye. Oh, Professor, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is of a hydrogen atom. Is it going to be much different uh, when there are more electrons? Because I imagine the perturbation is going to change because of the presence of other, other electrons, right? Yeah. Um, you can have some complexities when you start including the electron-electron interactions. That's right. And But this is the starting point. So this is always... so So... If you want to include the electron-electron interactions, really what everyone always does is you, you have to have some starting point, you know, the basis, 
the starting point. And so this would, this would define the starting point. And then you can add the electron-electron interactions as an additional perturbation. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, I see. Yeah. But like, are they going to be like compatible in terms of energy, like contribution to the energy change to either fine structure or, or uh, Z-man? Because then we would have a- you, Wait, wait, you're asking me how strong are the uh, electron-electron energy corrections? You're asking me how strong they are compared to these terms. That, that's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> That's a question. I don't. I don't know the answer. I think. I think the answer is sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller, and sometimes they're the same. You know, there's always three regimes: strong, weak, intermediate, right? And so, uh, I think it completely depends on which. On every atom is different. Every scenario is different. I. I don't really know. I think that that's a that's a that is an important question. And I think that atomic physicists do know the answer to that question, but I am not an atomic physicist. And so I, I do not know the answer to that question. It's a good question though. It's a totally relevant, good question. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.